We serve a God that gives you exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think. Be the good and mighty and worthy God.
If I could be so bold on this morning, God has brought us through some things this week. If you didn't bring me through something, something wrong. But we all are going through something. But Sister Rose Marie, we can give God praise because we were not consumed. The something that we're going through consume somebody else. But by God's grace and God's mercy, it did not consume us. He's wonderful. He's wonderful. Come with me. Back to Second Corinthians. I've been in church all week. And God has shown himself faithful on this week. I'm tired, but there's still a word from the Lord. Amen. 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 So come with me to 2 Corinthians chapter number 2. Beginning with the fifth verse. Did I be have a transparent moment? Reverend Slater, as I read this text, I had to pause. And I had to call out to God. Because I was guilty. Amen. And what we're going to discuss on this morning is forgiveness. And we've all been through situations that have hurt us. I know, I know. And we struggle with the concept of forgiveness. We might say we don't struggle with it. But if you like me, you do. Because sometimes that wound starts to itch. And it may not be a fresh wound, but you know that the wound is still there. But Brother Brown, what I realized yet again when I was reading the text is that God has forgiven me. Yeah, amen. Come on down. And because he has forgiven me, I should be forgiving my brothers and my sisters. I don't want to get ahead of myself in the text. But the world teaches us to go after our enemies. If you watch your favorite movies, the hero always goes after his enemies. The world teaches us that being like Christ is weakness. But when I'm in him, Brother Brown, I'm strong. So let's go to the text. Second Corinthians chapter number two. Beginning with verse number five. From the New Living Translation of the Bible. Paul states, I am not overstating it when I say that the man who caused all the trouble hurt all of you more than he hurt me. Most of you opposed him and that was punishment enough. Now, however, it is time to forgive and comfort him. 
otherwise he may be overcome by discouragement. So I urge you now to reaffirm your love for him. I wrote to you as I did to test you, to see if you would fully comply with my instructions. When you forgive this man, I forgive him too. And when I forgive whatever needs to be forgiven, I do so with Christ's authority for your benefit. So that Satan will not outsmart us. For we are familiar with his evil schemes. Now, verse number seven, once again for emphasis. Now, however, it is time to forgive and comfort him. Otherwise, he may be overcome with discouragement. You may be seated. For a few moments, I want to talk to you from the subject. Let me help you get back on your feet. Turn to your neighbor. Declare to them, let me help you get back on your feet. And as a theme for today's message, a servant of God must strive to forgive. A servant of God must strive to forgive. There are many times that we have been done wrong. And being done wrong, Elder Kill causes us pain, unlike any pain we have ever felt. We may have seen it coming, or we may have been blindsided, but no matter how being mistreated enters our lives, just Lisa, it still hurts. Yeah. Reverend Slater, it's uncomfortable, and it ushers in a disconnection between the one who was hurt and the one who had been wronged. The hurt that we feel causes us to lose trust. It causes us to feel distant. And it causes us to be broken. And even though we are put back together again by the hands of the master, we are simply not the people that we used to be before we were broken. Brother McGuire, we have been broken. And we find ourselves in unanticipated pain due to the hurt it causes. And our desire in the natural is to strike back. And we have a desire to retaliate and get even because we want the person to experience that pain or even worse. However, my brothers and my sisters, in the midst of being hurt, in the midst of having our trust violated, even while being broken, we are mandated by God to love and forgive just like he loves and forgives us. Do I got a church up in here? See, we live in a culture that views forgiveness as a sign of weakness. If I can be so bold, it has been ingrained in us through society's influence that 
we get them before they even get a chance to get to us. But we are called, Deacon White, to do what God's called us to do. There are even experts out there that claim forgiveness is unhealthy. There are some self-help experts that promote the fact that people should focus on improving their self-esteem. And they do this by deflecting and blaming others for their problems. And they blame others also for the hurt that they have inflicted upon them. Understand that the victim mentality is quite popular. And as a result of these perspectives, vengeance and retaliation is exalted over Christ-like virtues such as forgiveness and restoration. I want us to understand that not forgiving others comes with a price. Because unforgiveness produces ill will. It produces resentment, hostility, irritability, and a desire for revenge. But when you choose not to forgive, it imprisons you. Not the person you are upset with. In essence, it locks you in the past and it keeps you from progressing forward. People that don't forgive, they keep their pain alive by constantly choosing to pick at the open wound and to keep it from healing. And this is done by reflecting on the hurt. Replaying the hurt over and over and over in our minds. Talking excessively to other folk about the hurt. And by contemplating retaliation, we want to do to them because we hurt. Understand, if we do not forgive, bitterness can take root in our heart. And it will cause us, be ready, to become defiled. Hebrews 12, verse 15 states, Look after each other so that none of you fail to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poison root of bitterness grow up to trouble you, corrupting many. But see, there's encouragement in the text. Understanding if we forgive our brothers and our sisters, we will be set free. We will be set free from our past. Set free from hatred. Set free from bitterness. Set free from having animosity. Set free from having anger that leads us to sin. Sets us free from wanting to retaliate and forgiveness. My brothers and our sisters, it relieves your tension. Forgiveness brings you peace. Forgiveness will bring you joy. And forgiveness will cause your relationships to be restored. In the text, Paul's supporters, or we can say the church, was offended because Paul was somehow 
publicly insulted. They have insulted the pastor. The church felt that the individual that came at Paul negatively needed to be dealt with more before being restored to fellowship. However, Paul calms things down and he simply lets them know that it's not that serious. Some of the issues that we are allowing to bond us down are simply not that serious. We are sweating stuff that is simply not that serious. Somebody talked about you. It ain't that serious. Somebody sitting here on seat in church. Find another one. It ain't that serious. Somebody called me out of my name. That ain't your name, is it? It ain't that serious. Many times when we are focusing on God, now when we should be focusing on God, we are focusing on stuff that sometimes ain't got nothing to do with us, but most importantly, it ain't that serious. See, it wasn't that serious because he didn't even bother Paul. He was not angry. He was not resentful. He was not seeking any retaliation. He simply dismissed the grief and the embarrassment that the person caused caused him. And he urged the church folks to dismiss it as well. Because guess what? It's not fruitful for kingdom building. Sister Olivia, it's just another distraction to keep us from doing what we are supposed to be doing. He dismissed it. And he said, church, you simply got to forgive. There are some things that we simply have to forgive. We want God to forgive us, but we want to hold on to stuff that simply is not important. And many times it ain't got nothing to do with us. But Paul encouraged the church to forgive. And he told them to forgive because, see, we really have no right to punish other folks. <laughs> One of my biggest prayers when folks wrong me is that God make their heart right. Because think of this glad if it is my prayer that God gets them, he can also turn it on me and get me. Somebody missed that. It is not the church's job to carry out punishment. And understand, in the midst of all of this that was going on, Paul refused to see himself as the victim. He simply forgave the brother and he refused to carry a grudge with the person that had offended him. We must realize that when we gather together and when we are apart from one another, we are always on assignment. And because we are on assignment, our focus should always be him. When we allow ourselves to be distracted, that is the beginning of us getting off course. Paul was not 
concerned about the offense. See, what he was concerned about was the church's response to the offense. Yeah. The defendant had caused sorrow. We don't want to overlook what he had done. He caused sorrow and he caused a disturbance. But guess what? He had repented for his actions. Amen. It Paul them to know that the sorrow that they experienced was limited. And it didn't affect all of them. Only a few of them in a small way. And Paul really didn't have much that he wanted to say about the subject. He didn't want to exaggerate, exaggerate what had happened. Instead, he encouraged the church not to blow it out of proportion. They shouldn't blow it out of proportion. Because the man had turned back to God. And let me throw this in parenthetically. Once it's repented for, the case is closed with God. Amen, lights. So that means the case should be closed with the church. Do we realize? That some of the things that we have given life to are not that serious that we have blown them out of proportion. However, all God wants his people to do is forgive and build their hopes on him. With that said, and I want us to pay close attention to this. What can we do as believers to successfully get those who wronged us back on their feet instead of knocking them down? Number one is very simple. For my note takers, show mercy. Show mercy. And think it was, I want us to understand that see, we are most like God when we forgive. So it is our mandate to show Mercy. Let me take a poll this morning. How many of us want God to show mercy to us? The eyes have it, and so is Karen. So we want God to show mercy to us. We ought to be willing to show that same mercy. That oh, let me. Let me that say complete mercy. Right. Not Sunday morning mercy. We just say, hey, how you doing? But that same complete mercy to our brothers and our sisters. We must be willing to forgive and be a source of comfort for those who have hurt us. No stuff. But this is a mandate from God. Amen. And I want us to understand that when we do this, Mother Wright it doesn't lessen who we are. That's right, man. That's right. But we should be willing and ready to forgive and comfort. And that shows more strength. The weakness. Also, when we forgive and comfort, it strengthens.
strengthens the connection between them and God's kingdom. Why? Because not only do they see the God in us, write this down, they experience the God in us. We don't want folks just to see the God in us. We want them to have a supernatural experience with the God in us. We have to understand that even in the midst of their folly, they can become disconnected if they get overcome by discouragement. So it is our mandate to be a people that encourage our brothers and our sisters even in the midst of our hurt. We should be willing no matter what we endure to commit, compel them to come to Christ not run away from the church. Point number one, show mercy. Point number two, I see you, Sister Regina. I'm going to go slow. Affirm and reaffirm love. So we show mercy and we affirm and reaffirm that we love them. See, we understand how much God loves us. And we have to put our trust in his love. And see, we understand that God's love and all who live in love with God, God lives in love with them. No matter how hard it, no matter how hard it may be, we must affirm that we love, and we must reaffirm behind affirming that we love them. Especially for those who have wronged us. Deacon Belchers. I know this may be a struggle. It may be hard. To be honest, it may be tough on our egos. Amen, lights. It also may irritate the broken pieces of our heart. But we are not called to be like the world. We are not called to take them out. We are not called to take vengeance. We are called to show love. That simply means God's people are called to be committed to love. If we are treated unjustly, and we will be treated unjustly, we are called to be committed to love. We all have been stunned by the actions of other folk. But in the midst of it all, we are called to be committed to love. We have all been baffled by the mistreatment that we have received. But we are called to be committed to love we all had to pick up the broken pieces of our life but even though we're picking up the pieces we have been called to be committed to love do I got five folks maybe ten or fifteen that believe that they are called to be committed to love. The songwriter said, when nothing else can help, love. Let's 
isn't me. And we ought to be willing to extend that same lifted love to each other. Point number one. Show mercy. Point number two. Affirm and reaffirm our love. Point number three. Through our walk of obedience, we restore joy and the peace of being connected in fellowship as we strengthen our spiritual man and woman against the challenges brought by about by our adversary. Don't get it. We understand. We understand who Satan is. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. If we don't show mercy, if we don't reaffirm and affirm love, if we fail to restore, if we fail to reconnect them in fellowship, the devil can set up a stronghold in our lives. I'm going to say it one more time. Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And we do. Can I take another vote? We all know that, right? All in favor? We know how it's happening, so it's scary. Since we all know that, Reverend Slater, why would we use the opportunity to invite him in? So we show mercy. We affirm and we reaffirm love. But not only that, we restore joy when we forgive. We restore the connection when we forgive. And we strengthen our spiritual man and woman against the plots of the devil. When we forgive, we simply comfort those who have wronged us. We do it not for our glory, but we do it for the glory of God. We do it so that Satan doesn't have any areas in the church to set up strongholds in our lives. David said, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. My brothers and my sisters, we are to dwell together in unity. I don't care what's going on. We are to dwell together in unity. This lets me know we should be willing to serve a God who is willing to forgive, to protect, and sustain. And we should be willing to forgive, to protect, and sustain our brothers and our sisters. We should be willing to help them get back up when they are down. We are to be people that build up one another. We don't tear 
might be an utter mess. We may feel that hope is gone. We may be broken in the spirit. But let me help you. Let me help you. Let me help you. Let me help you get back on your feet. Let me help you. Let me help you. Let me help you. Tell your neighbors and let me help you. Let me help you. Let me help you get back on your feet. That should be our declaration. Help brother Abdul get back on his feet. Help the sick and shut in get back on their feet. Help those who are weary. Get back on their feet. Help those who are lost. Get back on their feet. I'm done. But I simply challenge us as a church to strive to be agents of healing. It doesn't make you weak. I don't care what the world say. It makes you strong. And remember, and I'm in my seat, when we're agents of love, people see the God in you. And they experience the God in you. The doors of the church are open. He's done great things. Yes, he did.